okay? So this talk is, uh, I don't think I'm giving it uh, a fair shake with the title that I gave it, but it's basically Tom Clack uh, giving us the update on um, efforts to work on American chestnut restoration, um, specifically here in Maine. And we're really glad to have Tom here. He's incredibly busy. He's got a lot of um, prospects in, the, uh, in that work. And I know there's a lot of people in this meeting today, in this program, that have had, um, who are all as involved and passionate about restoring the American chestnut as, as Tom. So um, Maine Woodland Owners um, is a membership organization. We try to um, do all we can to provide resources, information for woodland owners in the state of Maine, small woodland owners. And um, I know that there's a lot of people interested in the, the plight of the American chestnut. So again, thank you, Tom. The way we're gonna work today is we have actually um, well over an hour, you know, hour and a half uh, for the presentation. So Tom's gonna have a PowerPoint presentation. He's um, said that he's willing to take questions throughout the program or clarifications. Some, some of this might be technical or maybe you just need to make sure you understand completely what he's saying. And um, please feel free to, you can wait, actually put your hand up if you have your video on. Um, if you click on the bot, if you uh, mouse over at the bottom of your screen, you'll see some icons. One says participants and another um, says chat, or actually more, click on more and then chat. Um, the chat area will allow you to type in um, your questions. Uh, and uh, you can send it out to everyone so we can all see the questions. So I'm going to go ahead and just say hello from Brunswick, because that's where I am today. If you want to send a message to everyone to say where you're, you're from, that would be great to know the range of our participation um, geographically. I know we've got an um, international crowd today. We have someone from Canada, so that's terrific. Um, and uh, so I'll be looking for the hands. I'll be looking for the chats, um, questions, um, and uh, let Tom know if there, there's questions popping up or clarification needs. Um, otherwise, it's all Tom, um, and he will be, um, I'm sure, happy to answer anything you've got. So thank you for being here and spending this beautiful um, afternoon or early, late morning into afternoon here on video, but I think it's gonna be a really perfect conversation. So Tom, thanks again. And um, I look forward to uh, hearing what the, the latest is on your um, American chestnut restoration work. So it's all you. Okay, great. Let's share screen. So I'm gonna run through a PowerPoint. Some of this will be familiar to some of you, probably a range of uh, background amongst um, you and then others that look at the video a little later. So um, we'll see what people want to spend more time on. So I'll kind of go fairly quickly and um, let's see here. Okay. That come through to everybody? Mm -hmm. There? Yeah. Jen, you got it there? Yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay, good. So, so I'm going to be talking about a particular um, a, approach to chestnut restoration. Some of you are probably quite familiar, Dave, for example, um, because he's growing them, um, familiar with the hybrid approach to restoration or the, 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 the breeding approach where we, we um, breed the American chestnut with, with Chinese chestnuts, which have blight tolerance. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about that approach. We can talk about it um, in terms of our discussion uh, but there's been some um, issues that have come up recently when we do more and more genomics, finding out that the um, transferring over the number of genes that are necessary from the Chinese um, chestnut over to the American chestnut is more complex than we had thought prior to genomics. And so that's, that's the needing a rethink. So um, what approach I am spending time on is the biotech approach, and we'll go into why that's I think quite promising. Okay, so here's the outline, six things I wanna talk about, um, and we'll go through these fairly quickly and chime in if you want um, to say anything, questions or comments. Okay. okay, historical importance of the American chestnut. This will be familiar to quite a few of you, but it's worth stressing why we're so interested in bringing the so-called redwood of the East back. Um, 
in the primordial forests of, of the United States from Maine all the way down to Alabama and even into northern Florida, um, giant chestnuts measured um, up to five feet in diameter, some were over 10 feet in diameter. Other hardwoods were also very big as well, um, but there were somewhere between three and four billion American chestnuts throughout that range. And you got some pictures there to give you a sense of the scale. I think it's always worth looking at pictures like these three here to remind ourselves what trees should look like when they grow to maturity and uh, engage where we are in terms of the, the quality of our, our forests. So we obviously have a long way to go. Um, chestnuts um, are really important ecologically. Um, the, the food value of them when they ripen in late September and into October is tremendous. Uh, it's a, pl a, a plentiful food source. That it's very nutritious. We've analyzed the nuts in terms of their nutritional value, very high quality, and um, more consistent from year to year than any other um, nut source, like beech nuts or hickory nuts and things like that. Uh, much more consistent from year to year. So it's a staple for all kinds of different uh, um, animals. I like this picture here on the right because it kind of makes the, the various animals that relied on chestnuts until the blight came along um, part of the tree because they were actually kind of, they were, they were chestnuts in that sense because they were, it was such an important food source. Um, and then even on the, the, the human side, chestnuts uh, harvesting was really important. Here's a lithograph from, from Philadelphia prior to the fung uh, chestnut blight. See a guy up there in the top of the tree here for scale. Look at the diameter of that tree. Um, and that, that was, again, the, were the kind of chestnut trees that existed prior to the blight and people going out and collecting them in vast quantities for their own uh, consumption. So this is all part of the kind of the cultural heritage of the American chestnut that we've lost and we need to bring back. Um, super important tree in terms of, of wood value, straight, branch free for 50 feet, um, uh, straight grained, easily worked, uh, important source of tannin for the leather industry, uh, used for all kinds of things, um, telephone poles, um, posts, construction um, material. Oftentimes the wood is used twice. Once it, the uh, barn gets taken apart, that was made from chestnuts, say in the 1800s, and now it's made into new things these days. Uh, so really valuable wood. And, and in fact, it was the most harvested wood um, in the United States, um, more harvested than any other species, again, prior to the fungal blight. So this picture now here kind of summarizes so many different um, roles that chestnut play in, in um, historical American society and, and American ecology, including beer. I think it's important to bring back chestnut beer. Um, and even fish benefit from the um, different um, flies that, that do better if they're eating uh, chestnut detritus. Okay, and what, so bringing back the chestnut um, to our culture is one of the things we're working on. And so this fall, I worked with an ice cream maker to make, to create a, a very use, very tasty um, chestnut ice cream recipe. This is a bitter for ice cream maker and mm. that turned out really well. So that's part of what we wanna do when we bring the chestnut back. Okay, so that kind of just gives you a quick sense that, man, this is a really important species that we've lost. We need to bring back. It's going to be so valuable for people, for wildlife, and for the ecology. Okay, so then quickly, what happened to the um, chestnut with the importation of the fungal blight? Um, it was first discovered in 1904 in the Bronx. It was probably brought in because people wanted chestnut trees that were not giant size that they could grow in their backyards. And so they were importing in the late 1800s, Japanese chestnuts and Chinese chestnuts, um, which and those species co-evolved with this fungal blight from Asia. So they are able to withstand it because this evolutionary process happened over a very long time. Our, our species had no contact with the blight and therefore had no um, immunity to it. 
And so this is what happened quickly then after 1904 in the first half of the um, 1900s, trees died. Here's what it looks like when the fungal blight um, enters the chestnut tree. It finds, you see on the, on the left side here, it finds these fissures to get through the protective bark. And then it surrounds the living layers, the cambium layer of the tree and eventually cuts off the tree above the um, canker and kills it while the roots um, will survive. And so that's why you see, like in this picture, you see some root sprouts coming up. That's always a, a sign that there's um, a problem with fungal blight um, attacking the tree because you see the root sprouts coming up and the fung fungal blight uh, looks like those pictures there on the right if you look at it under a microscope. Okay, so that's what it looked like. Um, here's some comparative pictures. The picture on the left is a giant chestnut tree in Reedfield, Maine, um, probably 80, 90 feet tall um, and blight free so far as I've been able to tell. Uh, so there are still some chestnut trees around and Maine has a good number of them. In fact, we have the tallest one in North America, thanks for the work of Brian Roth to find that tree um, from aerial reconnaissance. Uh, and then the two trees on the right are what happen to, happens to chestnut trees when they get the blight. You can see this sort of sunken canker here on the left side of the middle picture. And then you know that the, the fungal blight is penetrating. Here again is the root sprouts coming up. And then a little bit closer up picture here on the right side of the fungal blight. And oftentimes it, it attacks the tree near a branch because that's a little bit of a weakness spot on the on the tree where it can where it can enter past the protective bark. Uh, and so yes, yeah, so the tree clusters and oftentimes chestnuts would grow in clusters like you see in this picture here and then so you see the chestnut skeletons in the early part of the uh, 20th century and since the tree is rot resistant they stood around like these skeletons for a long time. In fact, you can still find trees to this day that look uh, like the ones in this picture. But the more important part of this slide is just to remind us, and you're woodland owners, so you know this, but it's worth reminding how many different imported pathogens and pests there are that have come into Maine. Um, and the list continues. This is a list that's not even up to date. It doesn't have the emerald ash borer on there, uh, but you can see a variety of different pests. So. So our forests, as, as you well know, are, in, um, are under threat. And it, I think it just further underscores the importance of bringing back the American chestnut uh, because there are forest gaps. And, and, and there's a lot of things that are, are threatening the forest. And this example of bringing back the chestnut, it's uh, hoped to be a model for figuring out the best way to attack the pests and pathogens that are affecting um, the ash and the, um, the American elm and the woolly adelgid affecting the uh, hemlock and on and on down the list. Okay, so that's what the fungal blight does, imported from Asia, uh, from Asian trees. Now let's talk about the biotech approach that I've, I've been working on to bring back the chestnut and try to explain just real briefly what, what's involved in, in transgenics. Okay, so there is a particular gene that's very common in nature and in many domesticated food crops that are list of right, just examples of them are listed here on the right side. Many things, some of these things you probably ate today. If you had a strawberry, if you had a banana, or if you had some peanuts or um, a piece of bread, then you ate this particular gene that we have targeted as the gene that can, that can protect the chestnut tree. So um, what, it, what, is, what it is, is this idea um, of the enzyme oxalate oxidate, we, we abbreviate it OXO, O-X-O, um, allows plants to um, reduce the toxicity of the acid that the fungal blight exudes in order to kill the plant. So when the fungal blight tries to attack the chestnut, it exudes an acid, kills the cambium layer, and, and then consumes the plant. It can consume other things other than chestnuts and it can live perfectly well without killing chestnuts. Um, but, but, it, but if there's an opportunity to go after chestnuts, it will. 
Um, so what, what's been done, and this, is, this was done, this specific um, uh, application of the ox, oxalate oxidate gene into the chestnut that was done at State University of New York Environmental uh, Forestry, Science and Forestry College in Syracuse. So they're the ones that did the actual lab work to create the, the transgenic chestnut. So chestnut has everything it needs um, and we're not taking away any genes from a chestnut tree. We're just adding one in this OXO gene which um, allows the, the chestnut tree to detoxify the acid that would otherwise kill it. So that in a nutshell, what is what we're doing with the biotech approach. And I think this picture is really useful. It shows what's going on. Okay, so there's the fungal blight there on the left and it's exuding its oxalic acid to try to kill the living layer of the chestnut tree. Um, and Charlie Chestnut there on the right now has a defense. And so it, it doesn't kill the fungal blight, it just deflects it. And it, there's a, um, some uh, off emitting uh, gases, namely carbon dioxide and hydrogen peroxide that come off when the um, oxalic acid encounters the, the oxo enzyme that's been inserted into the uh, chestnut tree. So that's how it works in a nutshell. Um, so lots of studies then have been done, again, from ESF in Syracuse to see, well, does this transgenic chestnut tree with the wheat gene function any differently, behave any differently, and um, interact any differently than, than with the other species that it encounters? So there's been many, many studies done, and this has all been submitted to the U.S. Department of Agriculture in hopes that it will be deregulated. I won't go into that, but um, bee, bee pollen has been studied. It's exactly like bee pollen from a wild tree. Tadpoles actually do better with uh, chestnut leaf detritus than they do with trees that replace the chestnut in the forest, like uh, maples and beech. So in some ways you can see, say that um, things like this wood, wood frog tadpole have been um, negatively affected and have not been able to thrive as much as they would if the chestnut were there to provide the detritus that they like to eat in order to mature. So that's some of the things that um, we could see happen when we bring back the tree. But no evidence that there's any negative ecological uh, impact. The nutrition value um, in profile is exactly like the wild tree. Okay, so that's how the transgenics works. Let me just briefly, um, talk about another part of the project, um, which is to find the wild trees and capture their genetic diversity. So just as important as finding a way to protect the tree through, through the oxogene that we just talked about, we also need to capture the genetic diversity in nature. And it's the coupling of those two things that's so key to chestnut uh, restoration. And in fact, here we go, Brian Roth's on the line and we got a picture of him with his uh, plaid red shirt there, uh, right in the center of the, of the slide as we were a few years ago, um, gathering wild chestnut um, seeds from wild trees in Kennebunk that we had discovered. Um, and so that's what we do. We go out and try to find the remaining trees that um, are still out there. There's still a number of wild trees that are producing in Maine. Many of them are dying. In fact, this picture is a good one here on the left because those trees, since we've harvested these chestnuts a number of years, has since been cut down because they were near the power lines. And so they're no longer there. So there's a very tenuous situation in terms of our wild chestnut sources. Similarly, on the right side, you see a beautiful chestnut tree in um, South Portland, but it's by itself. It doesn't produce any fertile nuts. Um, it's isolated from any mate that could pollinate it. it pollen, uh, chestnut trees can't pollinate themselves. So, so what's out there in nature uh, or even in uh, urban context, um, very tenuous. We need to, we, we've done a lot of work over the last four or five years to capture the genetic diversity of the wild trees. Here's, um, here's one of our key locations where we work for chestnut restoration. This is the Ram Island Farm uh, in Cape Elizabeth with the, the Sprague land. Seth Sprague's one of your um, directors. And this is John Green, who's now actually taken over Seth's job as president of the company. And he, worked, he and I work closely 
on um, chestnut restoration on their 2000 acre site. And this is him gathering chestnuts with me last fall. And the tree that this, um, these seeds come from is one of the trees that we will pollinate with the transgenic um, pollen this, this July when the female flowers are ripe. So we collect seeds from different sources, um, gather them up. You see there are still some available out there. Um, and in what we do in my university, University of New England, but also at Unity College and at the University of Maine Orono, is we grow the, seed, the seeds uh, from the wild trees up in greenhouses between February and now, and then plant them out in orchards that are um, devoted to capturing genetic diversity. And that's what these, this look, I'll show you a few slides of these orchards, what we call germplasm conservation orchards. So here's one up in um, Piscataquis County um, and the different collaborators with the American Chestnut Foundation main chapter are varied. This is the Soil and Water Conservation District collaboration, um, pretty much up there in the middle of the state. Um, here's another one um, at the Holt Research Forest uh, near Georgetown, Maine, south of Bath. Again, a diversity of wild Maine, mostly Maine, but uh, it, beyond that as well, other New England sources of mother trees that are represented in these orchards. And so these orchards then are really, are all in one very easily accessible place. The trees are not giant size, so they're not 80 feet off the ground. How do you get to the female flowers? It's hard to get to, so we can get to them soon when they mature. Um, and, and, the, and the diversity of, of, of wild um, pollen here, uh, or, or uh, uh, genetics, is tremendous, all in one site. So that's the importance of the GCO, or chestnut restoration. Here's yet another example of these orchards. Here's one again at the Seth Sprague family land in Cape Elizabeth. And note, so you can see a couple of these that are above these tubes. We put, use these tubes to make the trees grow faster and also protect them from deer browsing. Once they get up over six feet, they hopefully are out of the deer browse range. And these trees you're looking at here in the center of the picture, these are only two year, these are two year seedlings. So these are two year old at the end of last year planted in May of, of 2018. So you can see the chestnut under the right condition can grow really quickly. Okay, so that's a little bit of the idea of capturing the wild genetic diversity. Let me talk real briefly about how we are producing in my greenhouse and lab at the University of New England, uh, pollen from this transgenic um, wheat gene uh, chestnut, because we need the pollen in order to take it out in the field and pollinate the wild trees. <coughs> Gesundheit. <laughs> okay, so yeah. Uh, okay, so here's what seedlings that have the gene, the oxo gene that protects the tree from the fungal blight look like. I get got these from um, ESF in Syracuse last July. Just twelve of them. And then we proceeded to use high intensity lights and, and, and large amounts of fertilizer. By December of last year, we were producing pollen off of these seedlings. And that's a very challenging thing. We're so happy to report because normally a tree would take many years to produce pollen. Um, four years would be probably the minimum, um, three or four years, absolutely minimum, um, and longer in some cases, but we are able to do it within, uh, within a year. Uh, we have a growth chamber that um, intensifies the experience to try to speed them along. Um, here's what chestnut pollen looks like um, up close, those little nodules there. Uh, it's very interesting to look at. Um, chestnut trees are giant sized, and so this part of the fun part of this whole chestnut experiment is working with trees that are 80 feet or more on the one, one hand, and then pollen, which is incredibly tiny. Um, and, you know, they, you measure them in micrometers, uh, so 15 micrometers. There's 10,000 micrometers in one centimeter. So pollen is really small. These little things here are anthers, and inside the anther is where the pollen is, which, which you, is amazingly tiny. So it's pretty cool from the macro to the micro um, scale. Okay, so then we 
we produce this pollen under high intensity lighting and we collect it. Looks like we're dealing drugs, but we're not. We're collecting pollen, putting them in vials and putting them in deep freeze freezers for storage to use next month. This is what some of these seedlings look like when we can get them to pollinate so quickly. Um, here are my students that are testing the pollen because we need to make sure that the pollen is viable. And so prior to the pandemic, when I had student help on campus, they were doing a lot of this great work. Now we have, I have Flynn to help me this summer, which is great um, as we do the next stages of restoration. Okay, so this, this looks like we're running a fertility clinic at the University of New England. Um, we are, but it's, it's, it's chestnut fertility, not human fertility. And what we're doing then is looking under a microscope when we uh, put the pollen grains into um, a sugar agar solution that, that replicates what the female flowers exude when they're ready for to be pollinated. And we're looking at these tubes. So these little lines sticking out in the picture, these little um, things sticking out from the pollen, that's what we're looking for. That's what a viable uh, chestnut pollen grain looks like. And so we need to test our pollen to make sure that it is viable. Um, so we store it in these vials. We store it at negative 80 Celsius. It's 110 degrees uh, negative Fahrenheit. It's extremely cold. And we uh, continue to test it to make sure that it holds up over time. So here's some more pollen that we tested after storing it under deep freeze conditions for three months and then we pulled it out and you can see all of those tubes sticking out. Every one of those then is a viable pollen grain. That's what we're looking for and that's what we'll be pulling out of the freezer next month when it's time to pollinate the wild um, female flowers. Okay, so then the last section then, thank you for your patience as we go through this uh, fairly quickly, is to talk about what we're gonna be doing in Maine for the first time this summer with the, the transgenic uh, pollen. So here's one of my uh, collaborators down in Massachusetts who's very good at um, pollinating trees under control conditions. He has not done it with the transgenic uh, pollen yet, but he's done many crosses between uh, the pollen from one wild tree to another pollen tree to, to increase diversity that way. And he's showing then a, um, an up close picture of what the female flowers look like that we need to apply the um, transgenic pollen to. So he stripped away some of the, the leaves and the male catkins in order to expose the female flowers. And those flowers then eventually will become the, the, will become the chestnut burrs. So what we do then is get up on um, giant orchard ladders and on uh, a lift like you see here and control pollinate chestnut trees. Now these pictures here are taken last um, July in Syracuse when we were working at the ESF college, um, but we'll be doing the same thing here in Cape Elizabeth this summer, having had all that experience last summer. So that's what it looks like. We wanna control which who is the dad? And so we're, we're covering the female flowers with the bags so that only the pollen from the transgenic um, sources uh, can pollinate those female flowers. And here's what it looks like more up close. And inside those bags, then we know exactly which pollen got applied. Um, and here's one of the quite a few trees at the Sprague land in Cape Elizabeth that we will be pollinating. This is a beautiful tree that's about 50 feet in height and about um, 12 inches of diameter at breast height. And uh, it's very just picture taken about two weeks ago. You can see it's blooming out beautifully. It's got tons of uh, male catkins on it already. We're waiting for the female flowers to develop. And that'll be one of the trees that we pollinate. Um, by lift, because there's no way you can get up there anywhere, any way else, except by going up in a lift. And this then picture is just a couple more slides to, to finish, and then we can have our chat. Um, this is a picture of what chestnut restoration could look like in, um, in uh, woodland lots in Maine. So this is a little experiment we have going on, again, at the Ram Island Sprague family land, where we've taken some of the seeds that we've harvested from their wild trees, grow them up in the greenhouse at the University of New England, and then planted out the seedlings. Now these again, seedlings, these seedlings are two years old. So this is the end of 
their second year of growth. Those tubes are six feet high. So you can see the, they grow very quickly under good conditions. And the idea is to open up certain small areas with sunlight and then uh, harvest, selectively harvest, sustainably harvest some, some trees and then replace them with chestnuts. So this could be a one way that this happens and then the trees are, are on their own to develop above the deer browse level. These are just the offspring of wild trees. We could do the same thing uh, beginning next year with the um, chestnuts that have the blight tolerant gene. Okay, so what's happening um, at the federal level is a review by the Department of Agriculture because they oversee any organism that has been genetically engineered like we have done with the insertion of the wheat gene into the chestnut tree. So, so the petition for deregulation has been submitted back in July, or sorry, in, in January. It's been uh, uh, deemed complete by the USDA, and now we are waiting for their um, open comment period to begin, which should happen very quickly. And we can let the uh, Woodland Owners Association know that that uh, comment period is open if you wanted to comment on uh, encouraging the USDA to approve the deregulation. They're interested in whether there is any um, risks associated with the mon uh, modified product. Is there any weediness? And the studies that's been done in Syracuse document that there, it's, not a, it's not a pest and it's not weedy and it functions just like the wild um, version um, without the weed chain. So that's happening at the federal level. There's plenty of work to be done uh, until this deregulation hopefully happens. So we're not sitting on our hands, but that's sort of the bigger hurdle to overcome in terms of chestnut restoration. Because then we can bring the pollen out uh, wherever um, there are wild trees and pollinate them with the blight tolerant pollen. Okay, so then in conclusion, this last slide, what can Maine woodland owners do to support the, this project of blight tolerant chestnut restoration in Maine? There's a variety of things um, members can do. Uh, one would be to, to please become a member of the American Chestnut Foundation Maine chapter. Uh, we're a volunteer organization. All the work you've seen in all these pictures is volunteer organization. Don't get paid a penny to do it. Um, but there's a lot of cost involved in the work and the member uh, fee, $40 membership uh, fee supports that work. So very crucial to have membership support to continue this uh, restoration project. Um, consider nominating yourself for the main chapter board of the American Chestnut Foundation. We need people that love trees. We need people that are dedicated to woodland health and, 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 and tree restoration, particularly the chestnut um, tree. If you're interested in that, please let me know. Um, grow wild trees. Maybe some of you know of wild trees on your land, um, or you can learn, you can grow trees from, from seeds or seedlings. There's much to be learned about how to grow the species. There the ins and outs, the peculiarities of the chestnut um, are as much to be learned using um, growing the wild trees, which are important for the genetic diversity. Eventually the blight will catch up to them, but it's very much worth growing the wild trees um, like, like we do. I've got many of them growing on my land. Comment to the USDA when that um, open uh, common period happens that you support the transgenic uh, chestnut deregulation. We can let you know when that happens in the near future. And then once the, hopefully the transgenic chestnut deregulation does happen, um, oh, oh, I didn't want to do that, here we go. Uh, we, uh, we would need you to host some of Maine's first blight tolerant American chestnuts. And we do need landowners, we can't do it ourselves, it's crucial, we, when we look to the future, we need landowners, land organizations, land trusts to host the trees. We can't do it without you. And people that have the land are gonna be absolutely central and crucial to the chestnut restoration um, project in the future, in the near future, we hope. Okay, so that's a quick run through of the project. Thank you for your patience. I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen, go back to everybody, no one's sleeping, that's a good sign. And um, 
and see what uh, people want to talk about, anything that came up along the way that you want to know more about or comments you have about the project. Yeah, Dave. Um, you should mute, unmute yourself. There you go. I got you. Um, I got a couple of questions, Tom. Oh, One is, um, I, I don't know if you remember or not, but at the uh, Ponderell Courthouse grounds, we have, yep. I found two um, mature uh, trees that are about eight inches in diameter. They're, they're probably 300 yards apart, so I don't think they're talking to each other as far as pollination right. goes. Right. <clears throat> but is there a certain age where the blight will hit hit the trees? No specific age. They tend not to affect um, seedlings and young saplings. Um, part of the reason is that you, you, they need the fissures in the bark in order to penetrate. Oh, okay. The, uh, the uh, young sapling will not have that. Um, it also depends on the density of trees uh, in a particular area. So I think what you're describing, you know, is not an area where there is a large concentration of chestnut trees, therefore not a large concentration of chestnut blight. Right. I um, have one uh, thing you could do though, Dave, is, yeah, is, is just, a, just one more quick comment on what you just said and then we will hear your next comments and questions. You could, you could gather some pollen from one tree and, and help it along, move the pollen from one tree over to the other tree. Um, that would be something to encourage it using a ladder, care, careful up on the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're really tall and they're, yeah. on the, they're on the bank of the river, so. Maybe you have a local source of um, a lift that wouldn't mind helping you out for a few hours in an afternoon. Maybe, maybe a drone. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's not going to work as well. Oh. Uh, okay, I got another you question. Get, you need um, to get the pollen onto the female flowers. You really need to be up there. Right, right. Another question is um, the young trees that, that we have, the five young ones that we yep. have between yep. three and four feet. Um, I noticed on your presentation that you had tubes around um, the young ones that, that, um, that you are growing in different orchards. Should, should we do that? uh at, at at the stage they are now or should i just leave them i have a cage i put a i put a new cage around yeah. them. the cage is three feet in diameter and four feet right. tall no, that's so. great no there's diff there's no one way to do it um i've been using the tubes more and more but some of the slides you they, they were they were not um inside those planter tubes um there's pros and cons to each each approach with the planter tube they grow, grow tall and skinny really quickly with the way you have them, they grow much bushier and wider. Um, right. Prettier, it's prettier to be honest. This year, since we have a lot of the um, ones in the tubes that are now over six, five or six feet tall, depending on the length, the size of the tube, um, we'll, um, we'll begin to see the branching out, the sideways branching out. But you already have that. So the key thing, I mean, one of the key things is to keep the, the deer from chopping the tree down. And as long right. as you had it protected, that's the number one thing. So no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't mess with them at all. So That's, so there's no need of doing any pruning of the branches that are coming out sideways. Not at all. No, just, no. Just let them go. I encourage that. Definitely yep. encourage that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I would fertilize too. We fertilize every every uh, spring. Right. Um, for the first number of years. So and you can use any kind of fertilizer, but yeah, I did. I did some. Uh, oh, good. What do you call it? Uh, Miracle Grow on them. This, oh, good. This Perfect. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Other comments, other questions? Uh, just to, to talk to Dave about pruning, I think it's a matter of preference what you want the tree to look like as it gets bigger, whether you prune or not prune. I, w I prune myself a lot of my trees just because I like Oops, the idea of a nice clean oh, spot for harvesting later on maybe, but not likely I'm gonna do that. But anyway, that's just ingrained in what I do. Right, one of the dangers is if every time you clip something off, you're exposing things below the bark, which is the, this, the protection of the tree. And so you're opening up a place where the blight can get in. Um, oh. And I've seen that happen on the biggest, one of the biggest trees in Maine is up in Dexter and they tri cut, trimmed a couple of big limbs off it had no blight up until now, and now it has blight because they exposed the living layers to, to the blight. So we need to be, be aware of that um, danger. Other comments? Brian, 
Brian, what's going on up there in Alberta? This is a quick summary of what, what's been going on since you, since you left Maine. Um, not much, just doing a lot of work remotely, uh, following everything that the Chestnut Foundation is working on. I still own land in Maine, uh, and uh, I think I've let my Woodland Owners membership lapse, but uh, when I get everything, when the virus goes away and everything gets back to normal, we'll be up and running again. So really excited to see the work that you guys are doing up there. Great. Great. Well, we stand on your shoulders because you, you were really, really crucial for a great number of years. And my getting into the science is really very much um, based on everything that you taught me over the years. I remember you and I went to that we were planning to go to that Pittsburgh science meeting and you said, yeah, this is how many now, four years ago, maybe. And you said, yeah, Tom, I think you can handle the science. So uh, kind of jumped in uh, full speed at that point and been trying to stay up with it ever since. It's a very, it's a really exciting scientific project with so much genomics and genetics now, which is important in any field of science and in medicine. Um, so it's really neat, neat part of the project and what we're learning, like we've learned about the Chinese hybrids. Yeah, Tom, can I jump in? Um, yeah. I'm, just, I'm curious, um, and I never asked you this, but how did it happen that, um, that, I mean, right now, University of New England and you are, you know, kind of leading the way on this, you know, breakthrough research. And I, I have been wondering, how does Maine fit into the big picture of and the university um, in the restoration of the American chestnut, because it's not just Maine, it's right. different parts of the country. And right. Yeah, and, and again, as I prefaced this, the whole um, backcross breeding program with the Chinese um, genes, that continues to go on. And many of our board members and volunteers are, are working on that project. We got Larry included, uh, 40,000 plus um, hybrid Chinese, uh, partial Chinese trees all over Maine and in, in, in orchards devoted to that. So that, that continues to go on here in Maine and, and, and across the country. The part that I'm, I'm focusing personally on is this, this biotech approach. Um, and so that's collaborating amongst, uh, it, and so there are there's sort of parallel um, projects going forward with some overlap between them as well. We don't know what the absolute solution by any means is, and we're, our learning is, is continuing literally month to month. What we'll know five, year, five um, years from now, we'll look back on this conversation today and laugh probably, um, because it's, it's really a dynamic field. Um, so, uh, so, but the main, it was interesting because I, you know, we create this transgenic pollen as I showed you the slides, and we and we at at the University of New England has been the main source of that this year for for the other five um, collaborators. So, so we're just working with them. We sent pollen out to Purdue. They're working there. We've sent it over to ESF in Syracuse. We sent it down to. Um, a man named Tom Sayeli from the Chestnut Foundation who works on Smithsonian Institution land um, and sent it to the University of Vermont, as well as the national headquarters of the Chestnut Foundation in Meadowview. So these are the people that are all working on this project of diversifying the, um, the genetics of the blight tolerant um, transgenic tree. Because it, I, I didn't mention the word clone, but the when, when you, insert the wheat gene into the chestnut, that, that starts as a clone. And all the original generation of those are clones of each other, exact replicas, which is the exact opposite of what you need in terms of chestnut restoration. So that's why we're so focused on finding the wild trees and preserving them uh, in these orchards, but also how to diversify um, what we uh, breed the transgenic pollen with. So it'll happen on six different locations this summer. The goal would, is amongst us that each site produce 1,000 transgenic seeds, which would be a major jump forward from what we have. This, this year we only have less than 1,000 total across all the different sites. And so you can see the goal of escalating the project, um, both in terms of numbers, but also in terms of genetic diversity. So 
So that's, that's how we fit in. There's, you know, not, all of this is very, very collaborative. Nothing could happen if in one institution or one just uh, one group. Um, and that's an exciting part of anything. Anything really, I'm sure all of you know, anything really successful is gonna be the result of um, collaboration. In, in this example of the conversation today, because we can do a lot of things in terms of the science of chestnut restoration, but your organization has the land and has the interest in trees and, and interest in growing healthy trees. And so that's, a, that's the kind of partnerships that we need for future um, success. Tom, I think uh, maybe adding that, uh, a little to what you said, uh, Jen, there are 16 different state organizations up and down the East Coast. All of those states are doing similar things to what we are or what we're talking about. So, it, so we have 16 different organizations all trying to get the biodiversity that we need to get that tree back in the wild. Mm -hmm. Great. Yep. Is that, um, did we clarify your question? Yeah, I just think it's, um, I, I just think that it's neat that the, this work is happening up here. And right. uh, just trying it, it all to started just real quickly addition on that it all started by the fact that I was staring at this unused plant growth chamber at the University of New England for a couple of years $46,000 machine you know and it's like hmm that's an interesting thing and it never dawned on me you know it's like you know it's something that finally you do you think well why didn't I think of that way sooner so that's how it started. I said, wait a minute, you know, this could be useful. Right. Um, so it started there and, uh, you know, told those that had the transgenic seeds and seedlings that I, I could try to use it to grow transgenic pollen quickly. Um, and so that's how it started. But then the other part of it, um, and I mentioned this briefly, is that I've been very interested in whether you can speed breed the seeds to pollen producing elsewhere outside of a, a fancy tens of thousands of dollar machine and we've proven that that's the, the case that you can just use ordinary led lights that you can buy for two hundred dollars and blast them with those lights at 16 hours a day um, and you can produce um, pollen that way so it doesn't have to be an expensive uh, undertaking that's going to be useful because we're going to need more and more people involved and so part of the what we've discovered at the University of New England is different ways in which you can make the pollen, the male portion of this coupling, the female portion is the wild trees. Uh, so that's kind of how it developed. Mm -hmm. And we've had more success than, than we, we thought at first. And very Yeah, I, I get the impression that you're, you're quite um, happy with how the success you're having. Yeah. Um, Good thing, again, I have Flynn here because the, he and I working in the field, he's not allowed to go to my lab because of all the restrictions. I'm barely allowed to go to my lab. <laughs> I go in every other day for about three hours. There he is. Um, uh, and, um, and do it. So, uh, but it's, it's definitely way scaled down than when I had three students working on all this stuff and doing all the great work that they did mm -hmm. up until they vanished in March. Um, so, we're, I mean, we're pretty excited that this project can continue to move forward. We're not all getting any younger. There's a lot to be done. And I definitely didn't want to lose a summer of the kind of um, advancement that we can make. Um, so, so yeah, curtailed to some extent. The pathogens are winning in my battle at the greenhouse because I just can't keep them in line like the students were able to. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but overall, we're, we're making Great. good progress. Uh, I just want to point out that John, yeah. I asked, uh, John asked about uh, if the large trees at Ram Island are natural, and then Flynn responded that they are, um, that they are not in the GCOs. They are not, those are the trees. Flynn, did you want to uh, clarify what you, your answer? Uh, yeah, I was just saying that the, I, I'm guessing that the large trees that they're talking about are the ones from the picture in the slides. Those ones are wild, but the trees that had all the tubes on them that were over like seven feet, 
those are um, seeds that were collected from the wild and then we planted. Right. And we're Thank starting you. Any genomics as well of trees and trying to decipher what you know, there's a lot of lots going on in the history of America <laughs> in colonization, and we can remember back to Thomas Jefferson and Monticello, and he had a whole bunch of non-American chestnut trees growing there in the 1700s. So um, we need to kind of abandon this sort of pristine myth that all we have is wild trees out there. We've been doing a lot of stuff to our forests over the centuries. And we're beginning to see some of the hybridity that that is out there, and we're finding out um, finding out about that. So, um, again, genomics is crucial for us to understand that, and um, and yeah, so that's that's one of the things we're just beginning to get our heads around. Does that answer your question, John? He's muted. Anybody want to say anything about their thoughts uh, with your landowners? You're thinking about your woodlots. You're thinking hopefully a little bit more about chestnuts. Hopefully you're a little bit more excited as we are in chestnut restoration. Can you imagine yourselves um, being part of this in the future? There he is. Where's John? Um, yeah, thoughts, thoughts from many woodland owners. Yeah. Matthew. So, so my question was, um, Tom. If the trees on Ram Island are natural, um, they must have some blight resistance. The big trees, the full-grown trees. Um, the, the, the trees have a lot of blight. They're very they blight. Yes. Okay. In fact, that tree I sent, a yeah, good question, John, and I glossed over some of those details. That big tree that um, I showed you that's so beautiful, um, it's looking more beautiful this year than it has in the previous three or four years that we've been monitoring it. And I can't say for sure why, but it may well be because I um, treated that tree with um, what's called hypovirulence. And that's, there's, there's, uh, there's a virus. It's, again, the, you know, we're dealing with the virus here at the pandemic, but this is a virus that um, uh, can reduce the, um, the strength of the fungal blight. And so that's, that idea of hypovirulence subjecting the fungal blight to a virus has been very successful in Europe. They have fewer strains of, of uh, fungal blight there than we do. We've got way more strains. We have many, many dozens of strains. So it's one species of fungal blight, Rhyphonectria parasitica is the botanical name, but there are many strains and you need to match, um, match it with um, a virus that can actually affect it. It's, it's complicated, I know, but it, it's important though to, to explain um, to, to, to an answer to John's question, why I think that tree is actually looking a little bit better than it has in the past. I treated the biggest canker on the tree uh, with um, hypovirulence twice last um, summer. And I think it did uh, reduce the aggressiveness of the fungal blight. But the fungal blight is everywhere. Larry and I have been monitoring the trees you know, some of the trees may not make it. We went to one tree that was a very productive tree last summer that we just discovered um, a couple months ago. And we, we discovered this year that it's beyond what it, it's reproducing capacity. Uh, Flynn was there as well. Um, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna have female flowers this year. So yeah, so the blight is aggressive. Um, and it's, 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 throughout, it's throughout the estate. Um, again, Maine is a little bit better off than a lot of places because it, the, the fungal blight um, is, is, um, doesn't like really cold weather. And so it's more aggressive in southern climates than it is here in, in Maine. And so that gives us a little bit of breathing room. It still has killed many trees, but helps to explain why um, we have still some, uh, quite a few surviving chestnut trees. That, that answer your question, John? Well, the, the, so you're pollinating a tree that has blight, and then I presume that the uh, chestnuts that will come from the pollination will be uh, genetically modified then? 50% of them will be. When you yeah. combine the DNA from the mother 
that doesn't have the gene and the father that does, approximately half of them will, will, will inherit the gene. And then we have a test to um, determine whether the seed has the gene. By the way, actually, can I just, I know, um, Mackin, you wanted to ask a question, but that's actually something really valuable that John just um, made me think about. So, so if, if you're a person, and this is a good idea, um, that wants the continuation of the pure American wild tree, then you should be in favor of the transgenic approach because half of everything we produce is gonna be pure American, non-genetically modified results. So we are in trouble in terms of the wild trees. The wild trees are functionally extinct right now, which means they cannot ecologically reproduce like, like normal. Um, the transgenic tree gives a new life, not only in terms of restoration, like we're talking about, and, and creating a tree that's blight tolerant, but just reproducing wild trees. So half of everything will still be pure American. Um, and, um, and so that's, that's kind of an insurance policy uh, and, it, and the other thing is that the, the transgenic tree can be easily identified. You can do a seed sample, you can do a leaf sample, and you will, can know uh, very simply whether that tree has the, um, has the wheat gene. So it's not gonna be a mystery, um, it's gonna be well known. So that's actually really, really an important part of what we're doing. Um, Mackin, you've been waiting patiently to, to chime in. Can we turn to you, you please? Thank you, Tom. Uh, I have a, you were thinking I live about. in Harp School and have a uh, woodlot here that I just logged in about two years ago and have a number of open patches that I'd like to diversify the, the future stand. And maybe offline you and I could have a talk about how I can participate. Sure, yeah. I gave um, Jen, I have land available. You could email me. We can be in touch. Um, and it'll, I think she'll post it as well. Great. For people to right so that's that's great sounds good we're not i can't you know as i tried to sort of explain in that last slide we're making tremendous progress but we're not there yet in terms of the availability of the blight tolerant tree um, in the next years we hope to be there um, and i think the progress has been very dramatic um, so it's, you know, there's, there's a lot to do right now, but we're not quite there because of various constraints we're working under. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else in the chat box that we, okay. Um, uh, forgive me if I, I didn't hear you talk about this. Um, you have a, um, you certainly have a uh, experiment site at one of our preserves in uh, Winthrop, Wiesendanger property. Did you, I, I'm sorry if you had mentioned something about that already, but that's where our, I know part of our tie-in is. Obviously, uh, Rams Island is a, um, is owned by one of, someone on our board, which is, um, was a neat connection, um, an article about the, um, the work you're doing there, but we also, I, I think we've had, and Larry, have you been involved in the Wiesendanger um, growing? Yeah. Do you yeah. have, a, do you, did you, have you been involved in at least the, the kind of the, the maintaining of that program? Yes. We, we also have, you, we also have a an experimental plot in Vienna. Yeah. On property. Yeah. As well as the one up in Winthrop. Yeah. That that seems like um, a really important, you know, opportunity for us as an organization to stay kind of in the loop. I think we're, we're kind of distant. We don't really have a, a lot uh, of um, information offered to our members about it, but I think that that's part of our mission is to make that land um, available to recreate, but also we can learn from it and get, um, you know, make progress on things like restoration. Mm -hmm. I imagine that seems like a good fit. Yep. Mm -hmm.
So are we, are we good? Are we out of uh, comments and questions? <laughs> like pulled people out of the beautiful um, summer day to do this and thank you for taking time out. Yeah. Just touch base. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I, I assume we'll have, um, you know, more information in the fall. Maybe you'll have some progress on the uh, sure. yeah. yeah. Definitely, you could, you could circle back and talk about what we did this summer. And, yeah. Um, yeah, 207, you, um, you had posted their video, but they're planning to come out again when we do our pollination. So we'll try to keep up, keep, the, keep you informed, the public informed of, of our progress this summer. Get some pictures of Flynn up there, 80 feet off the ground. He, he's excited about it. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Too high for me. <laughs> but it's got to be done. Trees are tall. Trees are a lot taller than us. <laughs> uh, well, and good luck with um, trying to get back into your lab, and uh, yeah, I'll be going there maybe today. a little bit. You know, maybe getting some of your your support back as well. That's yeah. That's going to be tricky. It's going to be tricky. Yeah. So definitely some some obstacles along the way, but we'll we'll figure our way through. Right. Well, thanks again, Tom. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for. And thanks everybody for attending. Thanks everyone. Oh, great. We have our next program next week on carbon and forests, and the projects going on in Maine around offsets, carbon offsets, and and yeah. large projects. So uh, check our website and register for that if you like. Another tie-in as well to Chestnut's a big carbon sequestrator. Ah. It's really fast and it doesn't rot. So. Oh, interesting. It holds a lot of carbon. That's that's another part of it. Another yeah. reason to save them. Definitely. Sure. Okay. Okay. Great. great. Bye. Thanks for the invitation. Bye -bye. Great. I take care, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye.